I want to show you how important it is for all of us to protect the most sensitive and beautiful parts of our planet. From Greenland to Antarctica, from coral reefs to rainforests, even if we believe they have nothing to do with our jobs, our businesses and our daily lives. I also want to learn together with you the solutions to the climate crisis that are available to all of us in different countries and regions. My name is Pancho Campo and my personal crusade is to show you through the Planet Future documentaries the impacts that climate change is having around the world because we cannot wait any longer. The time to act is now. Since I was a child, the Arctic and the Antarctica have always caught my attention. I used to read with great interest about the expeditions of Amundsen, Shackleton and Rasmussen. And I always had a certain fascination with Greenland, which has always been high up in my list of places I always wanted to visit. Climate change has become the biggest threat to our planet to our society, to our businesses, and to each of us. When I became interested in studying climate change, visiting Greenland became a must because the Arctic has grown to warm twice as fast the rest of Earth, with much of Greenland seeing a significant increase in temperatures of more than three degrees Celsius since 2015. Planet Future documentaries will take you and I around the world to show you how important it is to protect the most sensitive parts of our planet, such as this one, Greenland, but also the Antarctica, the rainforest, coral reefs, and the marine environment. This is why I decided to create the Planet Future Foundation a non-profit organization that will show you the impacts that the climate crisis is having all over the world. And most importantly, the solutions that are available to all of us. Even if they have nothing to do with our daily lives, our jobs and our businesses. We want to encourage you to act as soon as possible, choosing the right leaders and demanding from your governments effective environmental policies. We cannot wait any longer. The time to take action is now. I want this to be my legacy to my family, my children and to society. And I will do that only with my iPhone and a GoPro. My name is Pancho Campo. I am 60 years old. I am a husband and the father of a son and a daughter. Greenland is the world's largest island located between the Arctic Sea and the North Atlantic Ocean. Most of its residents are Inuit, whose ancestors migrated from Alaska through northern Canada gradually settling across the island through the 13th century. Three quarters of Greenland is covered by Earth's only permanent ice cap outside of Antarctica. With a population of almost 58,000, it is the least densely populated region in the world. Although Greenland remains politically part of Denmark, it is autonomous with the island's home rule government responsible for most of its domestic affairs. My trip to Greenland was organized with the support of Visit Greenland 
and with the help of Sven and Anya from Northern Explorers. However, it was my Inuit guide, Julius Nielsen, who helped me the most, took me around Tasilak, introduced me to his family and to the Inuit culture. He also took me dog sledding, sailing around icebergs and organized many activities that allow me to learn about East Greenland, the Inuit traditions and the impacts of the climate crisis. Julius is a true Inuit, born and raised in Greenland, proud of his roots and his ancestors. He is also a hunter, a fisherman and a musher, the title given to the person who drives a dog sled. Tell us a little bit about you. You're a hunter, you're a fisherman. Yeah, I'm, I'll be 44 in a couple months. And I'm born and raised in this area, actually 45 kilometers away from here, in north. A uh, small village with the name Tinit, Tidredan. And uh, <coughs> I lived there until I was a teenager to take uh, the last two years uh, public school here. After that, I uh, take to Denmark to learn the language. And take a to case in West Greenland, uh, between uh, West Greenland and Denmark, technical part of the school in Denmark and practical things in mm -hmm. Luk. After that, I come back here and work a little bit until I can see, okay, that's not what I want. So I jump on over to what I usually do when I was a child, when I was a teenager, and what my ancestors always do, the hunting, the fishing, and uh, with the time, with with uh, with the tourist material. Okay. So all your ancestors have been hunters and, and fishermen. Yeah, they're mostly hunters because uh, fish, uh, fishing it's a uh, it's not usual in East Greenland. Mm -hmm. It is somehow, just uh, but the, uh, it's not that important like now. Uh, mostly hunters uh, because hunting without the hunting, our ancestors cannot survive in this area. Mm -hmm. What do you hunt? Uh, the most important uh, animal is seal. Uh, without the seal, uh, our ancestors cannot survive in this place. So seal are very important in all days and very important still. Today. Mm -hmm. And you hunt them for the meat, but also for the skin. Mostly for the uh, for the meat. The the meat is very important food for for the local po uh, people. Um, so what I got is fine for my family, for my friends, and if they are more than what we what we can use, we can sell them. Okay. But the skin, it's possible to sell it to a company, but it's uh, very cheap, so it's not for commercial. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned that in the summer you do mostly fishing, and um, what what do you fish? Uh, Depends the prices of uh, of the market uh, of the market, but uh, the last two uh, two three years it's more halibut. Halibut it's a it's very good price. Mm -hmm. So that's what uh, what I aim for uh, when I. But it's still possible to fish after uh, cut, uh, but it's very cheap. Okay. So halibut is my favorite. Yeah. And what what about tourism? Has has it increased a lot? I, tourism before COVID-19, it's uh, bigger and better and uh, easier because uh, in the beginning we, we don't know how to uh, manage that. But uh, with time we, are, we learned that and uh, we learned the language. So it was um, bigger and better with time. And then COVID-19 arrived and destroyed everything. <laughs> everything is uh, actually green and are in, uh, isolated from outside in almost two years. The capital city of Greenland is Nuuk, and most of its population is concentrated along its western shoreline. However, 
the destination of my expedition was East Greenland, which is one of the most isolated regions in the world, but also one of the most amazing and breathtaking places I have ever visited. But getting to East Greenland was not easy. One must travel via Iceland, and from Reykjavik, you must fly to the island of Kulusuk, which is a small settlement from where we took a helicopter to the town of Tasilak. Tasilak has less than 2,000 inhabitants, and it's only 100 or 105 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. The name Tasilak means the place with a lake, and it's the largest town in eastern Greenland, also the gateway to pretty much every kind of experience Greenland has to offer. We work mostly with diving and other activities, um, nature-related activities, and it's an amazing area to work out in nature. Of course, diving is a quite special thing to do in the high Arctic. There's not so many people in the world who, who, uh, yeah, who wish to dive in minus two degrees Celsius cold water. So, of course, most people um, visiting the area, they go for dog sled, for skiing, for snowshoe, uh, hikes. Uh, actually, there is more people crossing the inland ice of Greenland from east to west or the other way uh, than coming for diving. So, of course, we're also involved in arranging other activities, um, but most, most of what we do is related to on the water and to wildlife activities. Winter season is more like for the winter people, you know, for the skiing, uh, for the ski dough, uh, mm -hmm. snowmobile, um, mostly for the dog sled, uh, hunting, fishing for people, culture, yeah. uh, smaller villages, uh, depends what they want. And many people arrive like a group, they uh, take a, a trip like a group, they uh, can ski uh, from here to the another village mm -hmm. and back again another way depends what what they want and what about the summer summer it's more it's, it's more smooth it's uh, it's better because uh, the trans transport it's much easier when people arrive to cool so we can pick them pick them up by boat and depends what they want uh, they can come to the town they can take it directly to the camps uh, or village depends on uh, what kind of product they buy Fishing, hunting, uh, to beautiful places like fjord, ice fjord. Uh, and is, is it really green in the summer? <laughs> Some pieces are green, but it's very rocky, <laughs> but it's beautiful. Greenland is a huge island. The north side is much more uh, tough. The mm -hmm. south part is more green. Yeah, yeah. So. One of the most visible ways to monitor climate change in the Arctic is by looking at the extent of the sea ice, which is nothing else but frozen ocean water that forms, grows and melts back into the ocean. Scientists study the amount of sea ice forming and melting every year, and it's an indicator of the condition of the climate. Greenland's huge ice cap covering 80% of the island is why it's a very important factor in the global climate system. This is the second largest of only two great ice caps on the Earth. The largest being, of course, Antarctica. Greenland's ice cap is more than 100,000 years old and up to two miles thick, accounting for what scientists estimate to be 8% of all of Earth's fresh water. If all this were to melt, it would raise global sea levels by more than seven meters. Have you noticed changes in the climate in recent years? Yeah, I mean, our ancestors, uh, uh, how they told about the, the past, it, they know it's, the climate is always changing, but it's like, a, it's like a stable changing, like up and down, up and 10 years with that kind, 10 years with that uh, another kind. But 
in our lifetime, it's something changing. It's a crazy changing to the other really? side, crazy changing to the other side. Summers are hotter and more dry. The winters, it's more crazy, windy. Uh, it's uh, actually, it's impossible to say next year, the, uh, the weather will be like this. It's a, uh, like this year, it's been crazy. So much snow, just beginning of the, this year, it, uh, the, the weather changing to the bad weather, and still keep going now. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's more extreme. Today Julius is going to take us dog sledding and hunting and as you can see there's hundreds of dogs around here they are preparing the dog sled putting the harnesses on the dogs and of course bringing the weapons because we're going to try to go hunting according to Julius dog sledding in Greenland is a way of life today snowmobiles have replaced dog sledding teams in most part of Greenland but the importance of these dogs remains very visible. They are still used for hunting, transportation, tourism and annual dog sled races. For centuries, dogs were used as the preferred method of transportation. These dogs pull kamutit or sleds, which help hunters by sniffing out sealed breathing holes in the winter and caribou tracks in the summer. Julius also explained to me that dogs provided protection by warning people about nearby polar bears. Dog sled teams use the ice to travel, but the reduced extent of sea ice and shorter freezing seasons due to climate change means that hunters have less time and less area to hunt on. People used to go hunting for weeks on the sea ice. Now they can travel only for short periods of time because there's too much open water destabilizing the surface. As a result of this reduced opportunity for hunting, some hunters are getting rid of their dog teams due to the high cost of feeding them and their maintenance. In the past 10 years, uh, we have observed big changes in, in, in climate, uh, which means like we get more extreme weathers, as we can see this season. Uh, so far, uh, we had a lot of snowstorms late in the winter, uh, a lot of canceled flights, very challenging ice conditions, snow conditions, because temperatures are um, going up and down. Uh, what we see in the Arctic is that the, the changes are quite dramatic and, and for us as people working in tourism is a challenge but for the people living here of course it's a disaster because uh, they are depending on that they can move on the ice if the ice is too thin, if the snow is too soft um, you get just stuck in your house basically.
Diving under the ice and next to icebergs is something very extreme and in the Arctic is a very demanding activity both physically and mentally. It requires a special training, procedures and equipment, not only because of the extremely cold temperatures, but mostly because it's an overhead environment with one point of entry and exit. This type of diving is a specialty in East Greenland, where my hosts, Sven and Anja from Northern Explorers, have found the best diving sites in the area around Tassilet, both for diving under the ice and next to the icebergs. During my stay with Northern Explorers, I also met a group of expert divers and very interesting people. Anna von Bötticher is an expert free driver and the German champion of free diving. She was traveling with Alex Dawson, one of the best underwater photographers. Greenland to me has always been a fascination uh, due to the enormous icebergs you can see. And as soon as I heard about Northern Explorers and that they do diving under the pack ice with big icebergs frozen into the pack ice in the Bay of Tassilak. I just felt this is something I have to do. And uh, I also heard that the visibility here is quite good. Uh, we can have anything between 30, between 30 meters and 70 meters in the winter time. The water temperature is really, really cold. It's minus two under the water. And uh, it's usually quite challenging to get out on the ice and everything, but in the end it's definitely worth it because the sceneries under and above water here in Greenland are totally amazing. We included this type of diving during our expedition to study the local marine environment. Interestingly, next to a site where Inuits once slaughtered whales, but more significantly to learn how ice behaves in response to the changing climate. On one of the evenings, Julius invited me to join his family at his sister's home for a typical Inuit meal. These traditional Inuit foods include Arctic char, seal, polar bear, and whale, often consumed raw, fermented, or dried. The foods, which are native to the region, are packed with the nutrients people need to stay nourished in the harsh winter conditions. Tobias is Julius's brother-in-law and one of the most respected hunters in all the region. The seal and fish which we enjoyed that evening was sourced by Tobias during his last hunting expedition. It was an interesting meal. Some dishes were very tasty like the fish soup and even the dry seal meat. But though I am open-minded when it comes to tasting new food, the seal feed were just not my thing. We spoke about hunting the Inuit traditions, and the new generations. We also discuss the impact of the climate crisis. What he feel uh, mostly changing, it's a current of the sea. The Gulf Stream who come uh, uh, around the Iceland, who will take south uh, along down to the east coast of Greenland, it's come closer to Greenland. And that's the God most effectful changing over here there, because uh, it's warmer uh, sea that means more difficult conditions with the ice. Uh, the evening ended with Tobias telling hunting stories and he showed us a video about his latest polar bear hunting expedition where one of the bears got dangerously close to his boat and his wife before he could shoot it. At Planet Future, we can say that we have been the victims of climate change. We've been stuck in Reykjavik for almost six days, waiting for our flights to fly to Kulusuk and then Tasilak, but they got canceled due to bad weather. 
And here in Tassilak, I've been uh, stranded for two days because once again, the bad weather has not allowed my helicopter to go from Tassilak to Kulusuk, uh, where I am supposed to take my flight back to Reykjavik. But Planet Future finally made it to Greenland, and I would like to share with you these two wines, which are the perfect reflection of the impacts of the climate crisis, but positive impacts. Until recently, these two countries were unthinkable as wine producers, especially producers of quality wines, Poland and Denmark. The first wine we're going to taste today comes from Poland, from the region of Dobre, and it's the Pinot Blanc Beton, made by Kamil Barsentewicz. Kamil is a very passionate and knowledgeable winemaker who was trained in Chile, Bordeaux and Burgundy. It comes from mineral and limestone soils with the vines planted on steep slopes, where the climate is extreme with very cold winters of minus 26 degrees. The wine was aged for six months on its lease in cement eggs. The final wine that we're going to be tasting today comes from Denmark. It's made by Sven Mosgaard at Denmark's most prestigious winery, Eskesogard, and it's a sparkling rosé wine. It is the Dons Rosé Brut 2017, a very nice and pleasant Danish sparkling wine. This was Denmark's first registered and licensed winery, as well as the country's most awarded producer. The wine is made with the grapes Rondeau and Cabernet Cortis by the traditional method and aged for nine months. Drum dancing enjoys social, religious and cultural significance. The drum dance is performed with a frame drum, also known as kilat, made of wood, and the stomach of a polar bear. The songs have passed from generation to generation, and usually they are myths and stories about animals and people. Caroline, who was our drum dancer, explained to us that these dances were used in its time for many different purposes, during spiritual ceremonies and for entertainment, but also they were used as tools for resolving conflicts. Enemies were given the opportunity to express their dissatisfaction with each other through songs. The social purpose was to clear the air, but in some cases the battle was so humiliating that the loser would decide to move to another village. In Greenland, bone pearls and amulets have been around since the first immigrants arrived four and a half thousand years ago. When you visit Greenland, you will soon encounter the term Tupilak. Tupilaks are bone figures that depict a spiritual creature created by humans. Historically, they were used by the shamans to cast spells on the enemies of the Tupilak maker. In Greenlanding, the word Tupilak means an ancestor's soul or spirit. Tupilaks have their origin in Inuit mythology and are works of art made from materials such as wood, bone, whale teeth, narwhal tusk or horns, and reindeer antler points. These small monstrous creatures have become quite a hit among visitors, and they are nowadays collector's items. However, the tupilaks made of narwhal horn and polar bear bones cannot be taken out of Greenland. The main differences that I've noticed, and I would almost say I've maybe noticed them most back home in Stockholm, Sweden, is that we're losing the seasons. We can get really cold summers all of a sudden we can get extremely mild winters uh, the snow what i remember as a kid you would have snow from october to april on a good year that doesn't exist since about five years in sweden and uh, these days you get snow you have snow for two weeks then you get 10 plus for three weeks and then you get snow again and it goes on and on like that
Although climate change has brought many challenges to Greenland and its people, numerous opportunities have become available as temperatures increase, the ice melts, and the climate becomes milder. Studies show that there are numerous rare minerals buried in Greenland's ice cap, which will become more accessible as the ice melts. Scientists predict Greenland possesses the largest deposit outside China of zinc, iron, uranium, gold, and other rarer elements. More than 90% of Greenland's income comes from exports of fish. As oceans warm, an increasing number of fish species find their way into Greenland's oceans, creating new opportunities for fishing. Local fishermen report that cod stocks are getting bigger and bigger, and while Greenland's cold water shrimp is moving further north, new fish species such as mackerel, herring, cod, and Atlantic bluefin tuna are entering the country's waters. Warming temperatures are also proving beneficial for the agricultural industry. As the climate becomes milder, the growing season gets longer and there are more opportunities to produce crops for local consumption, especially in southern Greenland, diminishing the need to import them from Denmark or elsewhere in Europe. However, the weather is still very unreliable and the industry is not big enough to sustain the whole country. Climate change also has benefited Greenland's tourism industry. As melting sea ice opens routes for trade, it also makes Greenland more accessible for cruise ships. More destinations in Greenland become available to cruise passengers, and more towns can benefit from the economic input of tourists. Although this was one of my most challenging trips ever and a very demanding expedition, Greenland did not disappoint me. To the contrary, East Greenland combines some of the most breathtaking landscapes on Earth with lots of activities, extreme sports and excursions with the local Inuit culture. In winter, it's not easy to arrive or depart East Greenland, but the trip is worth the effort. Tassilek and East Greenland are one of the most magical parts of our planet I have ever been to and an experience I shall never forget for as long as I live. This expedition was a great start for the Planet Future Foundation and its documentaries. But most importantly, it reinforced my belief on how crucial it is to protect the ice caps and the most sensitive parts of our planet from the climate crisis. Please support the Planet Future Foundation so we can continue with our mission of protecting our planet and fighting the climate crisis. Thank you very much.